Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Sarah Harrison. I'm the Vice President of the Philanthropic Services Group at the Denver Foundation, Colorado's largest and most experienced community foundation. We appreciate your making time to join us today for our second virtual issue briefing on the foundation's response to COVID-19. This is part of our service to fund holders and other donors and also our commitment to the community. As we begin today, I'd like to ask uh, that together we take a minute to do two things. Uh, one is to honor the lives of those lost uh, during the COVID pandemic in this country. Uh, it's over 100,000 in the United States and over 1,100 here in Colorado. And also I'd like us together to honor all the people who are keeping us moving and healthy and cared for and supported, all those essential workers, whether they're medical, uh, public safety and health personnel, uh, safety workers, delivery people, and of course, all the, all the people in the stores. So if you'll just take a minute to honor our community that way. Thank you. Now let's, let's begin. I'd like to introduce my colleague, our Vice President of Strategic Services, Alyssa Kopp. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we wanted to go over a few logistics before we get started. Um, this Zoom call is being recorded and you have the option of turning off your camera if you um, would not like uh, to be seen when we share this video with other fund holders. Right now, we have everyone muted. Um, we're gonna start with sort of a panel presentation that'll last about 30 minutes, um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And finally, you're welcome if, to submit questions via the chat option that you'll see down in the middle um, of your screen after Daly removes the slide share. So you can put those in at any time. Um, and then after the panel presentation, we'll take questions both from that chat and also we will unmute people and invite you to ask questions as well. So with that, we're gonna get started. And uh, I did wanna let you know that our CEO, Javier Alberto Soto is joining us on the call. Um, he is calling in, um, he's traveling and had some connectivity issues. So you won't be able to see him, but he will be joining us later in the call. With that, I'd like to turn it back to Sarah. Thanks, Alyssa. So uh, two themes uh, emerged for us in this new normal uh, at, at the Denver Foundation, and those would be generosity and partnership. And a moment ago, we honored community members lost and also uh, still working together to keep the community going. I now have the honor of thanking those of you with us today and also hundreds of others who aren't able to join us today for your increased generosity over time and especially during this time. Community foundations are public charities organized by, for, and of the community. We're in the business of mobilizing resources and energizing community members to look up, lean in, and work together for change. I'm going to give you just a few indicators of the generosity and partnership that you and fellow fund holders and other donors have demonstrated to and through the Denver Foundation since March 13th. Uh, first of all, we're uh, lucky to have over 600 donor advised fund uh, holders with our organization. And as you can see from the screen there, uh, donor advised grant making already a generous 16% annually increased some 90% for March and April over the period 2018 and 2019. Same period, same donors, extra generosity. In the past 11 weeks, our donor advised fund holders have made grants exceeding 21.4 million. These grants have gone to local, state, and national nonprofits, but especially local and state, engaged in all aspects of community improvement and COVID relief. Everything from arts and culture to health and human services, education, the environment, and everything else you can, you can think of. 
Of that 21.4 million, almost 2 million has come to our own critical needs fund. And you likely recall this is our quick action fund for emergent basic needs, especially in crises. This is a permanent fund of the foundation created in 2006 and activated over time for various issues, hunger, housing, and now COVID. In a moment, you're gonna hear about how we've deployed those gifts that you've provided in a way that has helped us to support the most vulnerable populations in our community, people always vulnerable and made even more so during this health crisis. The Critical Needs Fund is at its core a big partnership, your generosity and our stewardship. Here are some other ways that we're serving the community by partnering with people who lean in and lead the change. Uh, you probably have heard us say that at the Denver Foundation, we strive to be uh, the philanthropic home for all types of people in the community. We welcome partnership with individuals, families, companies, and community groups, large donors, small donors. We work to add value by connecting people of mutual interest, topics of arts, the environment, climate equity, identity, housing, hunger. We provide research, recommendations, and grantee vetting to our donors. And what I mean by that is, while we're very involved with people who are highly engaged with philanthropic activities that interest them and probably have long interested them, sometimes people do ask for advice and they know that we have deep expertise and community connections to help. So here are just a few of the questions we've answered over the last 10 weeks. What organizations are supporting single parents of low income who need things like diapers and food? How do I help native populations that are being decimated by COVID-19 at a much higher rate than others? What support do schools need for teleteaching and remote instruction? Who's providing good mental behavioral health services in this crisis? Help with food security. Where can I help with housing security? When donors pose these questions to us, we're able to draw on the deep experience of our grant making experts in the community grants program here at the foundation. We're able to community needs and opportunities with donor intent. Finally, I wanna give a shout out to and highlight one of our community partners, uh, the Lao Fund, which is a field of interest fund, part of our permanent corpus at the Denver Foundation. A field of interest fund is one where a donor describes a field or type of work to support and we help select the grantees. The Lao Fund, established by the Lao family over 25 years ago, focuses on developmental disabilities and also neurological disorders. They have two grant making application periods a year and this year with COVID added a third. And they did so in partnership with the Denver Foundation and our community grants program. Uh, in April, we shared with the Lao Fund applications that we received in their area of interest, which is developmental disabilities and neurological disorders. And the Lao Fund reviewer selected more than a dozen grantees in that area and deployed over $200,000 to this very vulnerable population. A great example of partnership. We're always honored to serve as your fund steward, your research assistant, your community investment partner, and your community connector. We are grateful for the opportunity to work with you with all the facets of the Community Foundation. Now, let's hear about some of the impact we've made and the lessons we've learned and about additional generosity and partnerships from my colleague, Desa West, who is our Vice President of Community Impact. Desa? Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to see you. Thank you for being on this call. 
Um, the last time that we were together, we talked to you about the way that we moved quickly and did things differently. Um, what springing into action as soon as we saw uh, what was happening with the pandemic. Um, we described to you some deep investment that we made to eight organizations who had deep networks all across the state, really hitting on areas such as food insecurity, housing insecurity, and violence. Since we last spoke, um, we've had an opportunity to create even more change out of the Critical Needs Fund, which as Sarah described, is a really ideal partnership between the generosity of our donors and the expertise of the foundation itself. Uh, we put together a low barrier application process, um, and as a result, had over 320 organizations apply to us, all of them working with highly vulnerable populations, either in the metro area or and, and focused on the areas that the foundation has the greatest expertise. So things like basic human needs, economic opportunity, education, leadership and equity, and behavioral health. Um, so lots of different opportunities for us to be supporting organizations. Some really tough decisions um, that we had to make, um, and we were ultimately able to support 44 organizations groups like Bayad Industries that provide employment and training support to people with disabilities, um, Casa de Paz, which works with immigrants recently released from detention, Colorado Jobs with Justice, which is working to um, support the health and safety of essential workers during this time, and Hope House, which is supporting teen moms with basic necessities. We turned those decisions around in 10 days and got uh, between organizations submitting an application to us and having a check in their hand so that they were able to get on uh, with their great work. Uh, what we saw from these applications were a number of trends. Um, one was, you know, kind of the, the biggest one and the one that you would expect to hear, which is that the need greatly exceeds the capacity. Um, and that philanthropy today is more important than ever to make sure that changes are happening in our communities and that basic services are being provided. Um, we also heard organizations describing the really dire consequences for the people that they were serving in an in a even more specific and deep way um, than is traditionally the case. We heard organizations telling us that they were relying on community members to act as navigators um, for people that they were serving, helping them find their way through the variety of services that are being offered um, during this critical time. And that more and more organizations were offering their services virtually. Sometimes that's something that had been, you know, kind of tried and tested like telehealth. Um, other times it was something that was a little bit newer, like remote learning and providing support groups um, together for, uh, for people that were being served and that the organizations were interested to see how those processes worked um, in terms of the service for their, uh, for their client base. We also heard organizations talk a lot about they were looking to work collaboratively. They knew that the circumstances were going to be um, different, not just today, but moving forward. And we're looking for different kinds of intersections and interactions um, with their fellow organizations who were providing supplemental or complementary services um, to those that they, uh, they were providing themselves. And we heard about large gaps in resource, not just from smaller organizations, but from larger organizations who traditionally have greater resources at, at hand. Um, the organizations were um, focused on many different populations, um, organizations serving people of color, um, people who were moving out of the criminal justice system, people experiencing homelessness, people who were undocumented, as well as other immigrants and refugees, students and their families, seniors and older adults, people with disabilities, and a number of other populations. So it was a really wide range of people needing support and service in our community today. And the areas of need were really similar to those that we talked to you about when we were together last. Food insecurity was the number one need, housing, housing assistance, rental assistance, and mortgage assistance, a really high need as well. Um, cash payments, um, as well as basic supplies and emergency needs. Um, but we were also seeing things start to emerge, like 
we need to think a little bit about the policies that are behind some of the reasons for this need um, and starting to move into asking questions about what's what's next um, after we uh, after we think about this most immediate relief and that was something that we kind of put aside um, and are thinking about now we'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we move through the presentation um, so let me talk just just very quickly about a few things that are in that um, flow of movement um, which have to do with a number of funds that the Denver Foundation is um, participating in or um, helping to stand up. Um, one of those is a fund that uh, we are engaged in in partnership with the Bonfi Stanton Foundation. It's called the COVID Arts and Culture Relief Fund. And uh, that fund is really designed to support organizations working in the arts and cultural space um, who may have had some deep financial impacts to their organizations as a result of the pandemic from not being able to offer performances or tickets or um, other opportunities for people to engage with them. Um, we'll be providing support to those organizations so that they don't go under and we don't lose those critical, um, those, those critical beautiful things um, in our society. We're also working to stand up a fund will be supporting organizations that are led by and serving people who are African American. We know that organizations led by people of color are at particular risk um, in this uh, current environment um, and so are working to find ways to support that population. We're also in development of a nonprofit loan fund um, that will provide technical assistance as well as working capital and bridge and equipment loans to nonprofit organizations um, who, again, may have had a financial impact as a result of the pandemic um, that we want to make sure are continuing to provide their essential services. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to my colleague, Mark Kling. He's the executive director of the Family Resource Center Association. Um, they were one of our earliest funded partners um, in the COVID relief effort. Um, and Mark has some um, pieces of, um, of thought that he's going to share with us both about the work that his organization is doing in some really amazing ways, um, as well as just seeing in the nonprofit sector. So, Mark? Thank you, Dace. Um, uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here and particularly appreciate uh, the generous grant uh, given to the Family Resource Center Association uh, and our Family Resource Centers uh, back in March when uh, we really needed it. Um, that kind of emergency funding is, is very, very helpful. What we're seeing, we have 32 family resource centers across the state and each one is its own 501c3 or separate entity in its own community. And uh, they do comprehensive coordinated casework with families, helping families become more self-reliant over time. And uh, the effect of the pandemic on our centers are that many other nonprofits in the community either shut down or partially closed down. And all of a sudden there were a number of families in the community that weren't able to go to their local food bank, for instance, if that had closed down or, or weren't able to get other financial assistance. Uh, the Family Resource Centers, uh, by and large, uh, stayed open, some uh, at 50%, uh, most uh, at above that level. And many of them moved into emergency services we went uh, primarily from prevention services, which we uh, do on a regular basis, and went primarily to emergency services as a result of the pandemic. Uh, some of the numbers uh, on that were quite striking. We have examples of uh, some of our uh, family resource centers uh, doubling, tripling, at times up to 10 times the amount of people coming through our centers asking for emergency services. Uh, one of them, our Family Intercultural Resource Center up in Summit County, um, their food bank uh, usually serves 4,000 people a year. Um, in March, at one point, they had 1,800 people, almost half that amount, come in one week. And uh, so we're seeing uh, those kinds of emergency services really start to draw down on the resources that our Family Resource Centers have uh, to work with families 
uh, not only with the food, but also uh, rental assistance and financial assistance. A couple of other statistics from a couple of other centers. Um, one of them went from financial and rental assistance, averaging eight to 10 families a week to 400 families in two weeks. Um, another one, the Mountain Family Center up in Granby, Colorado, uh, went from 216 housing and energy assistance applications a year to 125 in a two week period in March. Uh, so families are getting slammed, particularly uh, families that don't have cash reserves that, uh, and, and many families don't. Most families uh, that are low income are one to two paychecks away from uh, possibly being homeless and that's exactly what's happened. Uh, most of the families that come to us um, are uh, in dire straits, possibly at risk or having already lost uh, their homes, um, and we've been able to help stabilize uh, some of that. So it's been it's been really uh, challenging. They, all of our centers have burned through whatever emergency and reserve funds they have. Fortunately, the funding community, including the Denver Foundation, has stepped up and, and given us some emergency funding. It's not everything that we need, but it's uh, it's certainly helping. Um, one of the things I'd like you to know is that our family resource centers also uh, do uh, child care and um, our early childhood education. And we were some of the uh, centers that remained open while other child care providers were providing, uh, were closing. Um, and we were providing services to many first responders that didn't have any, they, they needed to go to work because it's the first responder community and hospitals and fire stations and everything else. Um, they needed a place, uh, a safe place for the children and family resource centers stepped up in that capacity also. So um, we've uh, uh, um, been very busy. Um, we believe that there may be a time in the future where we'll want to move back to the prevention services we always do so that families can continue to move uh, more towards self-reliance and not always be in an emergency. And what we've seen in past uh, economic crises like this, like the 2008-2009 crisis, is after um, emergency funding has been given by the funding community, many times as we're trying to move back to prevention services, there's a lag in funding as funders move into strategic planning and figuring out where they want to put their money. It, they might actually not uh, be uh, giving resources out for a while. And I would encourage uh, the Denver Foundation and all other foundations uh, and philanthropists to, to look at that and see if we can do both emergency funding and also the prevention funding um, during that time period as the crisis starts to wind down so that families don't slip back into uh, needing more emergency services and continue on that um, approach to becoming more uh, self-reliant over time. And that's all I have unless you have any questions. I don't want to take up more time than you've given me. Mark, let me ask you a, a question. Um, we heard a lot from um, nonprofit organizations about collaboration um, and the kind of importance of collaboration during this time. I'm curious if you have a perspective on that. Is that something that you see as um, being critical? Is that something that is just hard to find time for with the kinds of numbers that you're talking about? Collaboration is crucial. The two things that family resource centers must do in order to be a member of our association are not only the uh, comprehensive coordinated services that they offer to families, but also to collaborate with other agencies who can give family services that that family resource center cannot offer. And so collaboration is always important. And we really saw um, not only funders step up, but other collaborative services step up uh, uh, to cover some of that. And also, uh, just from a personal standpoint, I go to a lot of collaborative meetings myself, and, and I wonder sometimes if that's when my time is best spent. But that's where we were able to move very quickly 
because um, people in those collaborative groups knew us and our work and we knew them and their work. And there was already that relationship and that level of trust together uh, so that we could um, move quickly and uh, move forward. And, and the, the assistance we got from the Denver Foundation is an example of that. And that happened to us many times over the last few months. Thanks, Mark. One more question before we um, transition. You talked about, um, I think, very eloquently the um, you know kind of tension between providing essential services and providing prevention services. And I wonder if you could just paint us a picture of what it looks like for you when those resources for prevention services go away. What actually happens in those circumstances? So, so um, we always look at emergency services as, as a way almost for outreach. So when families need emergency services, they come to our family resource centers, and we wanna provide those services to the families. But eventually, as we're giving them rental assistance, we want to talk to them about moving into uh, getting a, a job again if they've been laid off, uh, or if they're having trouble getting early childhood care so that they can go to work, we wanna help them get that early childhood care. If they need some adult education so that they can uh, uh, get employment uh, or otherwise get services, we wanna give them that too. If we continue to only give families emergency services, let's say help with food nutrition, which is crucial, um, or, and help with rental assistance, which is also crucial. If we continue to do that, but don't offer the other prevention services, that family will not be able to be as self-reliant over time uh, as they want to be and as we want them to be so that they can eventually move to a place where they don't need those types of services anymore and become much more self-reliant. And there's an interplay between that, but we find during a, a crisis, all, most of the money goes to emergency services, which is perhaps as it should be, but we eventually wanna move back to prevention services without too much of a gap in funding. Yeah. All, of our reserve, all of our financial reserves are burned out right now with all of our family resource centers. So there'll be a difficult transition in coming up, upcoming in the next year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that was a really beautiful articulation of the kind of movement um, that is inevitably going to happen um, across our community um, as we think about the next stage of the work. And so our president and CEO, Javier Alberto Soto, is going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about the way that the foundation is thinking about that. So I'll turn it over to Javier. I'll go ahead and check in with Javier um, and see if he is having some more connectivity issues. It's been storming like crazy down in Miami. Um, while I do that, Desa, uh, we received a question uh, asking how many nonprofits are applying for COVID assistance? How large of an increase in requests is TDF responding to? Well, um, I don't know the full number of organizations applying for COVID assistance. You know, there's there's 13,000 nonprofits in the just in the Denver metro region alone, and many more statewide, um, who are I would hazard a guess um, all in a place um, where they're either seeing the kind of increase in service that um, Mark was talking about. Um, which is something that we're hearing many, many nonprofit partners um, describing or um, who have lost revenue um, from inability to provide services, um, inability to have um, fundraising events, um, those kinds of things. So I think organizations are looking to all kinds of sources um, and philanthropy is definitely one of those. Um, for the Denver Foundation, um, as I mentioned, we um, had a special funding round. Um, it's the only open funding round 
um, since the um, since the crisis began um, and received about double the number of applications um, that was in addition to the funding round that we were in the middle of. So we had about 120 applications plus about another 320 that came in um, for us to review. So that was um, that was quite an increase for the foundation. We're anticipating that for some of the funds like the Arts and Culture Fund, the African American Fund, um, it, that we'll see some other opportunities to support nonprofit organizations um, and that those uh, application efforts will have really high subscription as well. So, you know, as I said, I think that the need um, really exceeds um, philanthropy's capacity um, to provide services and you know, particularly with the state and city budget situations, I think that's only going to be um, exacerbated further um, as we look at the, the coming period of time. Great, thank you. Um, I think we uh, are able to go back to Javier now. Uh, Javier, can you, well, let's see if we can I'm hear I'm here. You. All right, thanks, I'm Javier. Here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Yeah, earlier I, I was talking um, for a while and gave a really, really fantastic speech that you all didn't, didn't hear, so I'll try to replicate that. Um, but thank you all for, for joining us today. You know, I want to go back to the top um, when Sarah talked about the over $21 million in gifts um, to help all of us in Metro Denver meet this moment. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your partnership. Um, it, it really is awe-inspiring to see how this community has responded you know, the Denver Foundation, as I think all of you are aware, we had to shift almost overnight into a whole new gear um, and get up and running remotely. And I can't tell you how proud I am of the team um, that has continued to deliver outstanding service. Um, and been working very, very hard on, on behalf of all the people of this community. Um, and again, in a whole new gear almost overnight. You know, I want to I want to build on what Desa and Mark were talking about. I think Mark put it in terms of moving from the emergency phase. Um, to the prevention um, phase. You know, for us, we're, we're looking at this pivot um, as, a, as a pivot into recovery and resilience building, all of that with through a lens of reimagining what philanthropy can do to attack the systemic issues that COVID has put a spotlight on. These are issues that are, are nothing new for all of us on this call today. Um, for those of us working in community building, working in philanthropy, um, these issues, particularly around inequality, are not new to us, but they seem to be new to a lot of people um, as they view it now in, in the context of this pandemic. So in, in my mind, this, this lens around reimagining what philanthropy can do must have a focus on closing that inequality gap. It's making this crisis so much worse for those who are poor, black, brown, undocumented, disabled, and on the front lines. You know, when 40 million people lose their jobs in two months and don't know how they're going to pay the rent or feed their family, something is very, very wrong. When black men continue to die at the hands of police and vigilantes, something is very, very wrong. And when over 100,000 people, mostly frontline workers, older adults, and people of color, die in the richest country on earth at rates much, much higher than in any other country, something is very, very wrong. And so that's why we feel as though we must pivot and we must attack these systemic issues. We welcome your support. We welcome your partnership to address these issues all with the goal of creating a more just and equitable society. That's what we're always focused on at the Denver Foundation. And now going to the next phases of this crisis, that is what is going to guide not only our grant making, but as Desa said, our involvement in pursuing policy change that can really start to, to drive at solutions, particularly at the local level, that can get at the heart of some of these drivers of inequality in our society. Great, thanks, Javier. Let's let's stay with you just for for a moment. Um, you talked about policy and systemic change. Talk to us about how uh, the funding community is working together um, in a, a really 
strong, mm -hmm. broad thinking way? And, and do you have hope that there's momentum coming out of this collaborative work to work for the philanthropic community to work together on some of the systemic change you're talking about? I do think so. You know, there, there's tremendous alignment in the Colorado philanthropic community. I think most of you have heard me say that I, I found this philanthropic community in this state to be much more collaborative than was my experience in Florida. So I think that's a plus. Um, I think that, you know, with the Denver Foundation sort of in a pioneering role, issues around racial equity have become central to many, many funders in the state of Colorado. I think that's also a huge boost to getting things done. And I know for a fact that particularly community foundations around the state are paying more and more attention to driving policy change and not just trying to drive change through grant making. I think that's also a huge plus. So for those three reasons in particular, I am optimistic um, because all of us are seeing the same exact needs, we're seeing the same exact gaps, and we're seeing, seeing the same exact systemic issues. So I, I am optimistic.